On today's episode of the Locked On the Louisville podcast, we will discuss what is at stake for the Louisville football team in Week Two's matchup against the Central of Florida Knights, and then we will discuss the basketball program offering a top ten prospect in the 2024 class. Let's get right on into the show. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome in to another episode of the Locked On the Louisville Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Upside. Download the free Upside app and use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. As always, I'm your host, Dalton Pence. I serve as a credential media member for Cardinal Sports Zone. I also do some PA announcing work for the university in various sports. I want to take this time to say thank you all for making us your first listen of the day. Just a reminder, the Locked On Global podcast is free on all streaming services, five days a week, your team, every day. We'll begin to preview the upcoming Week 2 matchup against the Central of Florida Knights um, by first discussing what is at stake for the Cardinals in Week 2. Well, a lot is at stake. We will discuss here shortly. We will identify the keys to the game as well. And then in the final segment, the Louisville basketball program offered 2024 top 10 prospect Trenton Flowers. So we will discuss that as well at the conclusion of today's show. So... Let's get right on into it. Answering the question, what is at stake for the Cardinals in Week 2 against Central Florida? Now, if you remember, I like I like this, um, this type of segment because it kind of gives you the full context and the, um, you know, kind of the weight and gravity of a certain matchup. Um, if you remember last week, Week 1, uh, against the Syracuse Orange, the uh, you know what was at stake was the continuation of the momentum, both on the recruiting side of things and with the fan base as well, and just around the whole um, you know program, I guess you could say overall. A week two, obviously, it is a little different with the loss against Syracuse in week one, especially in a, in as embarrassing fashion as it was. There is a ton of urgency to acknowledge. Now, look, I'll be honest. I don't like speaking in absolutes. You know, I don't like, um, you know, being cliche and saying, oh, um, insert game here is the most important game in program history or, you know, something along those lines. You get You get where I'm coming from. So I don't like to um, you speak that way because I think it can kind of be viewed as tacky or cliche. I'm not suggesting it, you know, that this game against Central Florida is like the most important game in program history. Not even close, obviously. Um, but I do want to pose a question. Is there a chance that this could be the most important game in Scott Satterfield's tenure here at Louisville? I think that that's a very valid question, and it's something that we can definitely have a discussion on because, you know, year one in 2019, can't really put that tag on any of the games because it's just so early. And the same thing applies to 2020, especially when you factor COVID into the mix and, um, you know, the ramifications of, you know, um, contact tracing and things of that nature. So the 2020 season was definitely, um, one unlike any other uh, return to a little bit of normalcy in 2021 in Scott Satterfield's third season. And um, outside of that, in that season, I don't necessarily think that there are that many games that can maybe apply to this situation. The only one that I'm thinking of is the game against Kentucky in the Governor's Cup at the end of the season. Um, I think that that may give this game as the run you know, give this game the run for its money when it comes to being the most important game in Scott Satterfield's tenure up to date when you talk about the implications that this game in terms of the result, what the implications may be and what they may lead to at the end of the day. So um, 
Obviously, that Kentucky game was very important. Um, it was a possible morale booster, a momentum-defining win for this um, era of Louisville football uh, that has Scott Satterfield at the helm. Unfortunately, Louisville got embarrassed on their home field on senior day or senior night, whatever you want to call it. So, yeah, I think that you know you could consider that Kentucky game to have been the most important. I mean, I mean, let's face it; it seems like if the rumors hold up that Scott Satterfield, there was a good chance that it could have gone either way of whether or not Louisville decided to retain him for year four um, in early December, and ultimately they decided to stick with the former Appalachian State head coach. And in year four, things are getting interesting. Um, I mentioned losing week one was going to possibly open Pandora's box. And what I meant by that is it takes away pretty much all of the momentum that you built up over the offseason, both on the recruiting front and just around the program in general. And now, you know, things get a little bit more interesting. I'm not necessarily, you know, saying that, you know, if Louisville loses this game, Scott Satterfield is going to be fired Monday morning. I'm not saying that. Um, but there is a lot of opportunity in this game, and there's a lot of things that are riding on this game as well. Opportunistically speaking, you have a chance to essentially alleviate almost all of the, of the doubters out there right now. I think if you asked a majority of the Louisville fan base, hey, if if Louisville lost week one against Syracuse, but instead they came out and won on the road in a hostile environment against a better Central Florida team, I think you would have Louisville fans probably thinking, eh, it's not ideal, but at the end of the day, I feel a lot better about the direction of this program now than I did 24 hours ago or even 12 hours ago. So there is a lot riding on this game from a momentum standpoint. Um, in, in To play the devil's advocate on the other side of the table, um, looking at the other spectrum, if you do not win this game, I'm not saying the season's over. I'm not saying that at all, and I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying this to portray a doomsday type of scenario or anything like that. I'm merely just pointing out the importance and the urgency of this week's matchup because if you win in week two, you know, I mean, you you alleviate a lot of those doubts. You show that, hey, look, week one, albeit as much as it was frustrating, it was an outlier. This program is not at that level. That was just a very, very poor performance. We are back on track here uh, heading into the season opener against Florida State. I think you start to maybe increase the hopes and rejuvenate some portion of the fan base because right now the morale is very low across the fan base. I mean, I can't tell you. I know social media only represents a good amount or a small amount of the fan base, but social media has been not nice to put put um, things into um, general terms. Uh, and but just outside of social media as well, there's just not a good um, vibe around the fan base currently speaking. So number one, opportunity. You know, you have a chance here in year four. You can't really claim moral victories anymore. You know, it doesn't matter if a team executed better than you. It doesn't matter if you even feel like you played well up to your standards. If you don't get the wins and losses, it does not matter. Last year, you could get away with it. I know myself included said, hey, look, I'm willing to give him another season because it does take a couple years to get your recruits in with a veteran led group that had a lot of key guys returning multiple, multiple starters, a majority of the starters. I think like 18 starters are back. There's no excuses. Now central Florida is a very, very tough opponent. They've only lost two games. I believe in the past four seasons at home or four seasons and one game at home. So that's something to focus on here. If Louisville goes 0-2, then you start to get – and you're, you might already be approaching this area right now, but you would squarely be in danger zone. Because, like I mentioned, 
it was critical that Louisville racked up the wins early on in the season because the back half of the schedule gets significantly tougher when you face teams like Kentucky, Clemson, NC State, Wake Forest, who now is getting Sam Hartman back. He will be starting for the Demon Deacons this uh, weekend and Pittsburgh as well. If you go 0-2, you're playing a Florida State team that I think a lot of people feel like are better than what was previously thought in the preseason with how Florida State came out against LSU on um, you know last Sunday. So a lot of people feel differently about Florida State. Um, and not to mention, I think you you dig yourself in a hole, not saying that it's irreversible. I'm not saying that you if you were to go 0-2 that you couldn't get out of that hole. Probable? Probably not. Possible? Sure. I mean, yeah, anything is possible. Uh, but there is a lot riding on this matchup. Um, I, I don't want to overanalyze it or hype it up too much, but I also do not want to overlook it because we need to start having the conversation that that is, you know, you're, you're getting into a dangerous area here if you were Scott Satterfield. Um, and the Louisville Cardinals, when I when you talk about where the program is heading, yes, I get it. The recruiting is looking good for now, but if you start out zero and two, you know, with a possible you know loss coming to Florida State week three, I mean, I'm not saying that all this is going to happen, but hey, we at least have to talk about the possibility because it's going to be a very important matchup on Friday evening um, for the Cardinals. So um, that's just my thoughts. I think that up to date, it is the most important. Um, game in Scott Satterfield's tenure due to the fact of, of what a win could do in terms of uh, smoothing over the fan base and getting the program back on the right track and, and how hurtful and damaging a loss would be. So um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into this matchup for the Cardinals. We'll talk about the keys to the game for the team here in the next segment after we talk about our friends over at Upside. Look, gas prices are astronomical. Sure, they might be coming down a little bit, but hey, you're, pay you're paying a pretty penny at the pump. Um to get in to getting an eye-opening check at your favorite restaurant inflation is hitting us where it hurts and it really hurts that's why i started using upside upside is an incredible app for everyone and anyone who buys gas groceries or dines out with every purchase i'm earning cash back thanks to upside with my new job i'm traveling more um, i'm you know eating more out on the road i am um, you know, driving a ton, you know, over and over. So, um, upside has been a no brainer for me. Um, you know, it's not too good to be true. It's not one of those catch 22s to where, you know, there's some things in the fine print that may, um, make you shy away. I've used it before and look, it works. It's a no brainer to get started. Download the free upside app. Use the promo code locked and get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business. Pay as usual with a credit or debit card and get paid in comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs. You can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Um, so the time is now. Download the free Upside app and use the promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more using the promo code LOCKED. So, as I mentioned, no easy task for Louisville to go down into Orlando and play a Central Florida team that is very good at home and come out victorious on Friday evening. The three Keys to the game for the Cardinals, in my opinion, are as follows. Uh, keep John Rice Plumley in check. Uh, contain him as best as you can. Um, number two, set the tone in the trenches in terms of the offensive line. And then finally, decrease the predictability on offense. Um, John Rice Plumley transferred in uh, last season, or I'm sorry, before this season, um, and got the start against the, uh, I think it's South Carolina State is who they played, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but Plumley spent the past three seasons at uh, Mississippi, was a guy that we discussed um, last season when we previewed, um, you know, Ole Miss and, um, you know, if we might see John Rice Plumley. 
Uh, but he was named the starter at Central Florida, and seemingly early on it seemed like the right decision. Obviously, playing a South Carolina State team that's not all that good, um, but looked solid in the season opener, both as a passer and on the ground. Completed 20 of 31 passes, 308 yards, four touchdowns, no interceptions, a 190.6 quarterback rating, um, and also led the Knights in rushing. 15 carries, 86 yards, and a touchdown, 5.7 yards per carry. Garrett Schrader um, was essentially unstoppable in the first matchup of the season for the Cardinals. And John Rice Plumley is essentially a better Garrett Schrader. Uh, throws the ball better and also is better on the ground, in my opinion. So um, it might be close on the ground, but still Plumley. Um, an upgrade in the passing department, but very, very solid. A veteran player that's played uh, ball in the SEC. Um, he's played against solid opponents. Um, you know, he's battle tested, and with a with an offensive guru coach like Gus Malzahn, um, the possibilities are limitless. So the first key for me for the Cardinals, it's hey, look, limit what you are giving this guy on the ground. Um, contain him as best as you can. That means, you know, whether it's incorporating a quarterback spy or just making sure that he doesn't, uh, you know, flee when the plays break down. Um, obviously, that means um, containing him in uh, read option situations, design quarterback runs, RPOs, you name it. Obviously, easier said than done. But I feel like when you force John Rice Plumley to only pass the ball or force Central Florida to get one dimensional in the run game, you take away one of their biggest strengths. Um, obviously, they they have a solid uh, group of running backs. Plumley has been solid passing as well. But hey, look, that was against South Carolina State. So maybe those statistics are a little bit inflated. But for me, number one here, um, obviously, I, I don't want to say be better at tackling because that kind of is going without saying, right? I mean, you have to be better at tackling. That's the whole point of defense. Um, but from a standpoint of, uh, you know, schematically, the thing for me is you saw what Garrett Schrader did when plays broke down last week. Um, when you gave him space to operate, you can't do the same thing for John Rice Plumley, or it is going to be a long Friday evening for Scott Satterfield's team down in the Sunshine State. So defensively speaking, I think it's pretty um, pretty self-explanatory here. Uh, John Rice Plumley. Uh, when, if you can you know, make him a little bit one-dimensional, you have a good chance to um, you know, try to limit this Central Florida offense as a whole. Uh, switching over to the offensive side, maintaining and or I'm sorry, setting and maintaining the tone in the trenches in terms of the offensive line. Look, it seemed like the offensive line last week was really struggling against Syracuse, and then when you factor in the um, injuries that Syracuse had, it kind of makes it a little bit tougher of a pill to swallow. Uh, but what was offensive line struggle then, whether that was uh, giving Malik Cunningham time to throw the ball? Now, obviously, I think that Cunningham uh, was a little bit out of rhythm all night as well, so not all of that is on the offensive line. Um, not a ton of you know, gaps to run through. Um, Syracuse's defense did a good job of stopping Louisville's running backs outside of a uh, big touchdown run from Tyon Evans. Uh, but, but but I think that, you know, good things happen if you're able to set the tone up front. Um, you know, Central Florida returns a lot of starters from last year. The defensive line may be kind of the weakest part uh, of the three aspects because linebacking is going to be solid. Secondary is good as well. You're replacing some of the bigger name guys like Cat uh, Bryant from last season. There's a lot of, um, you know, things that you can accomplish if you're able to set the tone up front. Obviously, I think that that does a good job um, of alleviating some of those concerns for Malik Cunningham. You know, he is a very efficient passer when presented with a clean pocket, one of the most efficient passers in the country over the past couple seasons in a clean pocket. So that's something uh, to hammer home, um, uh, you know, creating some, your holes for the running backs to run through um, central Florida's biggest defensive question coming into the season, according to a lot of people was, Hey, look, how well are they going to be in terms of def defending the rush um, Syracuse? We didn't necessarily know they look solid. Can't necessarily be the case this week against central Florida. And if you were 
um, you know, dedicated to running the football, then, you know, obviously it would be solid if, if the offensive line is able to create um, some holes to run through. Um, and then the final one, it's decreasing the predictability on offense. Um, I think that, you know, kind of telegraphing what you're doing in terms of, um, you know, maybe always running on first down or, you know, running on second down as well, just switching things up. Uh, I like the trick play that got Braden Smith, the deep pass to Tyler Hudson. Um, you know, I, think that getting guys like Marshawn Ford and Amari Huggins Bruce the ball out in space would, would be something to focus on as well. Just something that um, you know takes away that predictability. You know, spice the offense up a little bit to where you know it, it's not as one dimensional. It's it's more so forcing Central Florida to react rather than just hey, um, you know, allowing you know Central Florida the comfort to have a good idea of what you're going to do because then, you know, your offensive line may not necessarily be able to protect all that well because the defense kind of knows what you're going to do. And then it's kind of like a trickle down effect, right? So I think decreasing that predictability on offense is another big key to the game. So going to be a tough one for the Cardinals. We will continue to preview that matchup um, heading in to tomorrow and on game day. So um, with the final segment, I, I wasn't going to, uh, discuss anything but football uh, up until next week uh, but the basketball program handed out a big offer to a top 10 prospect uh, on Wednesday that has a lot of Louisville fans excited we're going to talk about that here in just a second I do want to say thank you all once again for making us your first listen of the day just a reminder the Locked On the Louisville podcast is free on all streaming services including YouTube and WHAS 11 plus five days a week your team every day Kenny Payne and company offered five-star 2024 top 10 prospect Trenton Flowers on Wednesday, uh, a prospect that just received an offer from North Carolina, um, has offers from a a bunch of top programs like Arkansas, Auburn, Florida State, um, Kansas, LSU, Maryland, Tennessee, uh, Oklahoma, West Virginia, so on and so forth. Um, A very intriguing prospect listed at six foot eight um and as a small forward on the 24 7 sports site 180 pounds out of the charlotte north carolina area uh but i saw i think somewhere on social media to where he was listed as a combo garden at six foot nine but regardless um i think his skill set is is a Extremely intriguing. I think he, you know, the way he plays basketball is very smooth and cohesive from a, a flow standpoint. Um, Adam Finkelstein of 24-7 Sports, the director of scouting, said this. Um, you know, he's highly talented with positional size, athleticism, and some tough shot-making ability. Um, let's see. Um, this is from Flowers. Uh, he told 24-7 Sports last month, I should be cutting my list down in October. I don't know how many yet, um, but early October. I don't have a set time for a decision, though. I'm just taking it one step at a time. Uh, there's been rumors that he's looking to visit Duke, uh, setting a visit to uh, the uh, Blue Devils program, um, you know, so on and so forth. This is an interesting situation because Louisville – Obviously, I think that he reacted well to the offer. Now, obviously, you can't read too much into social media, but it seemed genuinely excited about the offer. Obviously, getting him on campus, I feel like a broken record when I say this, but getting him on campus would be a big step into getting involved in this recruitment. And obviously, kind of the telltale sign is um, trying to make him enough ground as you can to get into that top list. Um, he is a 2024 prospect, so even if you don't make that top list, and even if you do, um, seemingly – unless he's looking to make a decision soon, you have some time, but I like this offer uh, flowers being, you know, six foot seven, six foot eight, um, very smooth basketball player. Um, like I said, a solid shot maker can create his own shot at all three levels of the offense. Um, athletic, you know, has, I want to get the, um, you know, the wingspan measurements because I feel like, um, you know, he plays a lot, taller than he is you know listed at six foot seven six foot eight six foot nine he might have over a seven foot wingspan because you know um very athletic um you know just overall a good feel for the game when it comes to team defense and just being able to move without the ball on offense 
Um, there's not, it doesn't seem like there's really a true weakness to his game. The jump shot is fluid. There's no hitch in the jump shot. It's, um, you know, cohesive. It's a, you know, free motion. So, um, I don't really have any concerns. I think obviously he's going to have to maybe add a little bit of weight at, at the collegiate level, but that, I think that that's the least of your concern there. Um, moves well in transition, and overall, um, you know, I, I watched some clips where he battled, um, you know, head to head with uh, Kentucky five star basketball commit Rob Dillingham um, and really held his own and um, really looked pretty solid. So obviously, it's going to be about, about a matter of getting flowers on visit or on campus for a visit. Um, and we'll see how it goes after that. But ultimately, this is a type of prospect that Kenny Payne. You know, was seemingly brought into the university to be able to really be seriously involved in in terms of recruiting because, hey, look, you know, he's been rumored to be a very, very solid recruiter. He's um, reached out to a ton of top 2024 guys, and this one might might be the highest ranked guy that he's reached out to and offered in the class. We've heard, you know, that Louisville is not a program with Kenny Payne that's going to offer a lot of guys that are going to be very selective with their offers. So that shows you that the Cardinals are looking to probably prioritize him pretty quickly. So if we have any more news in terms of list cuts or anything like that, we will obviously have another segment talking about Trenton Flowers. Um, tomorrow's episode of the show, we're going to talk – players to watch, and final predictions for the UCF game tomorrow night. Thanks again for making Locked On the Louisville your first listen every day. The NFL season starts tonight. It's been a long time in waiting. For your second listen, go check out the Locked, or I'm sorry, the Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 and eight-episode extravaganza to get you ready for the NFL season. The local team experts of the Locked On Podcast Network, plus a betting angle from Lee Sterling of Locked On Bets, all combining into one Ultimate NFL Preview. Search for Ultimate Pro Football Preview 2022 on your Odyssey app, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. That's going to wrap up this Thursday edition of the show. Everyone have a great day. We will see you right back here tomorrow.